Hello and welcome to the breakout session on intersection of mental health and substance use. I'm Sandy Schaefer and I'm going to be moderating this discussion. To get us started though, we're gonna have a centering moment from someone in recovery. I'd like to introduce Andy. So my name's Andy and I was always good at hiding what was inside. I was a square peg made up of anxiety and ADHD, and the world was not accepting of these things. So I learned to stuff it and hide, and I wore what was called, to me, what I called the mask. My whole life from little on, alcohol was part of it. It was unusual to go to a bar, to get people for Sunday dinner, just to be put on a bar stool, bought root beers, candy bars, chips, allowed to play the jukebox, things like that. I love the vibe there. People having fun, buying me soda, candy, music. I loved the beer sips. I loved how the beer tasted good and made me feel relaxed. As a teen, it was never hard to get alcohol or drugs. That was convenient because that's when my depression showed up. But I could use the substances to stuff and put on the face. I had a huge tolerance. Later in my teens, depression got so bad I couldn't always find the face. And then there was a suicide attempt. Mental health issues were not discussed back then, and help was in its dinosaur days. There were maybe two meds. The meds had to go because I couldn't drink on them. I still saw alcohol, especially as my unfailing friend. I finally got the mental health help back be because, or the mental health help that I needed because when I was in my 20s, um, my cousin Tony was murdered terribly in Milwaukee for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I couldn't find any happy. I still wore the face, but my drinking got worse. And although I tried stopping, it never lasted long. I was lucky enough to get a really good shrink. She likes it when I called her shrink. As a matter of fact, we called her shrink a lot and she used that as her little name on her email for a while. <laughs> <laughs> she was amazing. She got me the right meds. She was wonderful. I got therapy for my trauma, but I kept using and it was getting harder and harder to hide. And it was messing things up for my family and my inner circle, and most of all for me. So, on a gorgeous day in May, I was drinking and I was hanging out in the backyard with my two little children, and it was just a typical day for me, and my husband came home from work and I could barely walk or talk. I was completely wasted. By then, my drinking was happening every day, and we knew that I was not able to hide it anymore, and I had to admit that I was very, very sick. I knew the wreckage of a substance use disorder and what happens to families, because I come from a family that has several alcoholics. So I began the most uncomfortable, humbling, best journey of my life. In recovery, I met people who are just like me, but weirdly honest about it. They didn't judge, and I didn't need the face in those rooms. I wasn't a square peg there, just a person with an illness. These recovery people loved me until I could love myself finally for the first time ever. I dealt with my trauma and slowly let these people in. I learned how important ugly vulnerability was and I felt safe. I was taught a new way of life and it was getting better and better 
and wanted to help others find recovery as well. I no longer wanted to be anonymous. My family and friends said, you can't do that. I said, just watch me. <laughs> then one of the best things ever happened to me. Two of my recovery friends told me about this new thing called Peer Support Specialist School. And they wanted me really badly in this school for the first time in my life with my addiction and my mental health issues. I was a double winner. <laughs> <laughs> I have been substance free for over 17 years now. Thank you. I work supporting others in their recovery. These people that I work with are my people. Solutions is my safe place. I stand next to my people and I fight stigma. I help my people discover their own recovery and their own pace. So many pathways, smart recovery, 12 steps, celebrate recovery, dharma, med assistance recovery, harm reduction, and it goes on and on. Sometimes it's just holding space for that person till they figure it out. I am Andy, I'm a daughter, a mother, a sister, a wife, a dog mom, a friend, a sponsor, a peer support specialist, a supporter, an advocate. I am authentic, blunt, sassy, loyal, awkward, and I'm so much more than my illnesses, and so are you. Thank you, Andy, for that moment to help ground us as we talk about mental health and substance abuse and realize why our work is so important. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Laura John is a clinical supervisor at Rogers Behavioral Health in Appleton. She started in the field of substance use disorder treatment in 2010 at the Department of Corrections. Laura's worked in residential treatment and at an inpatient psychiatric unit, working with domestic violence survivors, women involved with the criminal justice system, and adolescents with mental illness. Laura has been with Rogers Behavioral Health for almost four years and helped lead the launch for their first regional mental health and addiction recovery partial hospitalization program. She works hard to be involved with the community and is, and is currently involved with the Outagamie County Overdose Fatality Review Board. Welcome, Laura. <laughs> Lindsay Lowy is a dual licensed mental health and substance use disorder therapist. She received her master's degree in art therapy and appreciates being able to use alternative methods in fostering overall well-being. Lindsay has a passion for utilizing research and brain-based practices to promote sustainability. She believes strongly in a system approach, which looks at both external and internal support to help achieve well-being. Lindsay currently serves on the Fox Valley Technical College Substance Use Disorder Panel, the Ripon Area School District Odyssey Academy of Virtual Learning Governance Board, and the Oshkosh for Education Committee, as well as numerous other community program engagements. Welcome, Lindsay. <laughs> Megan Edwards is a licensed substance abuse counselor, currently at an addiction therapist at Fond du Lac County, where she treats mental health and substance use disorders. She has a background in addiction and mental health and has worked in the field for five years. Megan's passion is in the treatment of individuals who have a substance use disorder to help them find a new way to live with purpose, dignity, and confidence. Welcome, Megan. And then, of course, the highlight is Griffin, who is a seven-year-old golden doodle who loves to show compassion and understanding. He helps people feel grounded, welcomed, and perhaps work through fears of animals. He is gentle and playful. He's hyperallergenic and does not shed. Make sure you get a, to snuggle, make sure to get a snuggle and a photo with him at our snuggle booth after session if you're interested. Welcome, Griffin. <laughs> 
And although there's a chair, I think I might stand a little bit. So Laura is going to start, but we're going to start talking about what people should know about co-occurring co disorders. Yeah, thank you all for being here. And, you know, really to start it off, we want to make this kind of conversational style. So I will lead and, and hopefully um, some of these other experts can also give some guidance. But I think the most important thing to notice, and I'm pretty sure that everybody's here in the room because you know this, um, the majority of people that come in with substance use disorders do have co-occurring mental health conditions um, that is defined by somebody with more than one um, mental disorder that they are struggling with, substance use being one of those most frequently, but doesn't have to be. This could be somebody with OCD and trauma um, that also maybe has had some struggles with a mild use disorder. So it can appear a lot of different ways, but I think SAMHSA's numbers were around 9.2 million in the US um, that struggle with that co-occurring disorder. And the real problem is, is that a lot of times we might get treatment for the mental illness and not the substance use disorder and vice versa that happens. So it ends up being kind of a whack-a-mole game, right? Where we just keep seeing it pop up and then we have people in and out of the system. What does a treatment plan look like for someone with co-occurring disorder? Okay, I got this one. <laughs> she gave me the look. So um, a treatment plan um, will look like anything that will help a person achieve some of their goals. And if you have a good relationship with your therapist, you're hopefully working on your treatment plan with your therapist instead of your therapist telling you what your treatment plan is. So um, really healthy wraparound treatment plan is going to include things like, you know, self-reflection, self-support, community support, family or friend support, these things that are going to give you kind of a multifaceted approach to what works for you. Anything, so anything are addiction and mental health connected? Let's raise your hand if you think addiction and mental health are connected. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. <laughs> What does it look like if someone comes into the office? How can you help evaluate if they do maybe have a co-occurring disorder? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's on. Okay, so what was the question again? I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Megan's like, right. don't call on me. No, it's okay. <laughs> well, how do you assess to see if one of the clients that you're seeing is having a co-occurring disorder? Okay, so it's kind of a loaded question because I do two different assessments for substance use disorder and mental health. Sometimes it's hard to see <laughs> and to weed it out just within an assessment, um, especially if the person is still in active use. So sometimes the you know, underlying mental illness or whatever else is going on is hard to see until somebody is abstinent. Um, or there's been times where I haven't thought that somebody had, you know, mental health concerns until they were abstinent for a little bit, and then it comes out, and it's like, okay, there it is, um, and vice versa. So where, where I work right now, I do outpatient and inpatient, and so we have a psychiatric unit where we do um, detoxes and things like that. But we also have, you know, chronic mental illness that we see there as well, and um, what we've been seeing a lot lately is like meth-induced meth -induced psychosis, um, which is really scary, but also what happens when people use methamphetamine. So that can be really hard to weed out too, um, whether it's schizophrenia, if there's underlying schizophrenia, or if this is just from the meth use, and sometimes it can take some time, you know, to figure that out. Um, you know, our speaker tonight, I think it was, or tonight, good. This afternoon, Kyle, he talked about that. You know, he had said that he had some time in recovery, some time in sobriety, you know, and then he figured out that he had some depression and anxiety going on. And I think that's really, really common. I see that happen a lot. Um, and that's okay. I mean, wherever it comes, it comes, you know, and sometimes it just depends on who I'm, like, where I'm seeing this person in their, like, cross-section of their life, you know, because it's such a small amount of time to assess somebody. So I don't I feel like I did not answer that question, but I'm just giving some of my experience with that. So there's that. No, you did great. Thank you. 
Lindsay, what are some of the needs of those with co-occurring disorders? What are people saying that they need or what kind of support do they need? So when I was thinking about this question, I thought one thing, how dare I be the one to sit up here and tell people what they need. So to go off of that point, can you just shout out some of the things, whether it's mental health, whether it's substance use, whether it's co-occurring, what do you hear the need is, either for yourself, or what do you hear people around you say their need is? Because that's a huge reason why we're here today as well, so that we as a recovery community and service providers can help serve you. So let's take just a couple seconds, just yell it all out. What do you guys need? Access. Access. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great. And those were a lot of the notes I wrote down, so yes! <laughs> um, you know, and I think especially post-pandemic, um, we're hearing a lot more um, of, I just need support, I just need a compassionate ear, I just need somebody to listen to me. And I think if we start to shift our way of viewing recovery and treating mental health or co-occurring disorders to, we need to support one another. We don't need to try to fix you or tell you what you need. We need to help you and walk alongside of you as providers. So everything that you're, you all said, we need non-judgmental people in our lives. We need you know, um, to continue to reduce the stigma, which is a huge bus to move. Um, we need a lot of different options, in my opinion. One type of therapy that works for somebody is not going to work for the next person. So having multiple options, multiple resources, and really having trained professionals that are willing to jump in to doing a lot of different types of approaches. Laura, do you have anything to add to that? I think that's kind of a loaded question too, right? <laughs> um, I think really what the, the panel here has like encapsulated is what it boils down to is what people need is to have access to care that will treat both, right? Like as far as assessment goes, yes, we have to determine that. Yes, we need to figure out is the substance use causing the psychosis, is the psychosis causing the substance use, I suppose that is helpful. But really what's most important is when somebody comes in front of me and they say, this is what's wrecking my life, let's change it, right? Like if today it's the trauma, let's do that. If tomorrow you're craving, let's do that. It doesn't matter and I think that as providers that's our obligation is kind of like Lindsay was saying, is to just really meet the person and recognize how much this intersects and that that whack-a-mole game means we need to work on all of it at once and not just try to address, well, if we get you abstinent, then we'll worry about the next. Like, that doesn't work. What we need to do is meet the person where they're at on that day. So, Lindsay, I know that you are a big brain person and through Not that I have a big brain. No, 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 no. <laughs> She's really interested in the brain. So I guess, and I know that you talk about talk therapy, only getting someone so far. Mm -hmm. Do you want to explain a little bit about what you mean with that? Sure, absolutely. So I feel incredibly fortunate that life took me the path that it did um, because I, I hate school. I never excelled in school. I got a D in my intro to psych class, and here I am. And life led me to the path of art therapy, because that's how my brain worked, and that's how I could make sense of things. And it's been one of the greatest gifts, because when we tap into the creative side of our brain, whether it's journaling, writing poetry, singing songs, dancing, art therapy, music therapy, equine therapy, play therapy, all of these creative-based 
things that we tend to have access to even if we aren't in therapy tap into the part of our brain where our emotions and the emotions from our experiences lie. So yes, I talk a lot about talk therapy, tends to get a person so far, and that's wonderful, that's awesome. If we can also work on introducing some creative aspects, whether it's in therapy or now all of you have this knowledge, go out and blast your car stereo and sing. That's tapping into the creative side of the brain. And what you're doing is you are also healing things that maybe aren't like present for you or aren't on your mind. Your brain is still working its way through some of the emotions that are stored. Thanks, Lindsay. Megan. You have worked with addiction for quite some time, and I know that you're a big part of solutions and the recovery housing and all of those things. And I'm wondering if you could take some time to just share with everyone, friends, family, service providers, coworkers, what is something or a way that they can be supportive of, of, of people who have these co-occurring disorders or who are struggling? How do you approach that? Yeah, so even just, at, so when the question was asked of what people need, and a lot of people said support. And I think as clinicians, I, I can speak for myself at least, it's like I don't get that much time with a client. You know, once a week for an hour is, is great. Um, on the inpatient side, it's different, but most of the outpatient stuff isn't, it's not every day. And so we can get some work done in an hour, don't get me wrong, but then they go home and wherever that home is, whatever that environment is, whatever support system, system they have outside of my office, that's really where the community support comes in and I, that's why I love an event like this. So um, just some like full disclosure of my, my, myself, I'm a person in long-term recovery. Um, I've been in the systems, I've been out of the systems, I've experienced an array of different struggles in my life. Um, so it's, I feel very privileged and honored, honored to be even here right now um, and sitting up here because sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay, anyway, so I just need to put that out there. I'm like a little intimidated. Um, but as far as support goes, you know, so much of it starts with compassion, in my opinion, and understanding and having some type of knowledge and experience specifically in what I've seen is having some type of deep emotional experience because oftentimes people come with their own beliefs, their conditioned beliefs, how they were raised, what their parents have told them growing up, different stigmas surrounding that type of stuff, right? And a lot of the times what I see is those stigmas and those ideas don't shift until they have an experience, right? Like whether it's a child, whether it's a grandparent, whether it's an aunt or uncle, somebody close to you, whether it's a family, friend, loved one. And then the table starts to turn a little bit and people start to open up. But I, I, it, there's trouble in that <laughs> because that means that somebody has to suffer in order for somebody to change their opinion, right? Or to be open-minded to something. And I think everybody, as human beings, we have these assumptions about people. And I'm just being honest, I'll speak for myself, me being in a recovery and what active use looks like. It's ugly, like it's not pretty. Um, we cause harm, you know, we try to get in between somebody and their drug and it's rough, especially if they're not done yet. So it's, it's hard to have those conversations. There's no doubt about that. It's, it's, it's heart wrenching. It's painful. It's hard to watch somebody go through that. But I think just having an open mind that like, even me being a clinician, I'm not an expert. Um, but also you don't have to be an expert to be able to support somebody that you care about or somebody that's struggling. And so much of it is just having that space and holding that space for somebody. Um, but what I've seen work for others too is like support groups are really important. Um, having people that understand them, having people that are gonna be there for them without that judgment. Gosh, so much of like addiction, mental health is like all up in here and just like sitting up in there, you know, until it can get out until the day, into the light of day. So that's kind of my response. I think, you know, shifting and just, and just being curious about your own assumptions that you have. Um, being curious about your own judgments that you may have. 
um, on, on substance use or mental illness or whatever it might be, and being open to some alternative, but just also remembering that like deep down in every single one of us, we're all human beings, we all mess up, um, and, and you don't have to be an expert to help somebody, so that's response. If each of you just wants to take a little bit of time to say maybe what your thoughts are on what's good and working out there or what we see as a area for growth. I feel like <laughs> I could get on a soapbox about this all day long and I do it frequently. Uh, so <laughs> We don't have all day. <laughs> you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, I think we all know this. I, in fact, just read an article uh, yesterday. Um, the fallout of the pandemic is still coming and we had a broken mental health system prior to that that is still going to suffer. We have a shortage of providers. We have a shortage of psychiatrists. And that isn't going away as um, the calls to resource lines increase like tenfold. Um, so that, you know, that's what's wrong. We still remain siloed, where as already been mentioned, um, we're treating substance use disorder and then saying we'll deal with the mental health later when we need clinicians that are trained to treat both and treat holistically not just the mental health and the substance use, but let's talk about how we treat people if they need to have their basic needs met. If somebody's sleeping on the streets, they really don't give a crap if they are drinking or using or their mental health is off. They want to be warm, they want some food. So we need to look at that as a system. <clears throat> some of the things that I can say from a hopeful standpoint is, I think that the, this event today speaks volumes to the hope that's out there. As long as people keep standing up, they keep saying, hey, this is my story, this is what I want to do, I want to be a voice, I don't want to be ashamed of this anymore. I share sentiments with Megan as a person in long-term recovery. I think we all need to keep speaking up. We keep need to pound the pavement and get people involved that can make a change, and those people are you. And I think this is, is where the hope is. Okay, I'll follow. Um, wholeheartedly agree, wholeheartedly agree, um, especially when you talk about you know, being siloed, not just substance use and mental health, but also I think what most people don't know is we are still really siloed as providers. Do you know how many new providers I met standing out there and I am a provider? That's really sad to me and upsetting to me. So if you are a provider or you do know providers, come meet me so that I can meet you so that we can continue to work together because this is a huge breakdown in our system. Um, the paper said that we had to be vulnerable. So it did, but I didn't need to put, I didn't know if anyone wanted to be pushed. <laughs> it's okay. I'll be vulnerable. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest things that drew me into the work that I do with, um, especially the dual diagnosis, I had an aunt um, who had multiple personality disorder and a lot of things on top of that entail with that, right? Think about it as each person in that personality disorder has their own mental health struggle or concern. So it just kind of depended on the day or the time that, and, and who was out. And that was the mental health concern that she was struggling with. Um, on top of that, she was also a substance user. And the system, my parents will still tell you, they feel failed her. And um, she did not get the appropriate care. She was very misdiagnosed. Um, and she died by suicide. And um, so that really drew me into being an advocate and fighting for systems to not be siloed, for systems to work together and to collaborate with one another so that we can learn from one another as providers to better serve the people that we serve. So that's my biggest gripe. <laughs> I mean, I have two, two. One, um, I mean, everything that you both have said as well. I mean, there's lack of resources all over the place, but um, one thing that I see as a struggle or as a barrier is when you look at dual diagnosis and you've got, there's 
there's its own set of struggles that come with substance use disorder. There's sets of struggles that come with mental health concerns. You have them both, and that's extra, right? And then you add on other layers of what I like to call and what it is, marginalization, right? And you've got the LBGTQ plus community. You've got you know, people of color, minorities, people that are in poverty, and you have all these different things that add on to that, and sometimes the systems don't address that stuff <laughs> um, or don't take a look at the barriers of getting access to treatment you know, in different populations and things of that nature. So that's one thing that I have definitely seen. Um, the other thing that I've seen from just experience with working at Solutions, so I had experience working in sober living for women, um, long-term care, right, six months, sometimes up to a year. Um, and what I would see, it would be really difficult when we, we were not at a facility that could do dual diagnosis, okay? And when we get somebody in, in the house and there was, there was, you know, mental illness that we just were not prepared to be, to be treating. And so we try to find them different resources of where can you go for long-term care? You know, not just the, the three-day, you know, hospitalization, not just the, the outpatient, but somewhere like, like a group home or somewhere that has programming and structure. And I, for the life of me, could not find anything. And I felt terrible because it was like, you're between a rock and a hard place. It's like, well, we, it, it's a disservice to keep you here because we can't treat this because we don't, we're not clinical, long story. But anyway, but on the other hand, I don't know where else to refer you to. So we ran into that struggle a lot as well, is where, where can there be some structured living, more structured living for dual diagnosis? And we just don't really have that in Oshkosh very much. Um, there's some places that, you know, you can stay for up to two weeks or things like that. Um, but those wraparound services and having that place for, for somebody to go as, as a, you know, stepping, stepping down or stepping stone to back into society. So those are my two things. Thanks, Megan. So we have about 10 minutes left, and I'm wondering if we want to just default, I have to get into that step on Griff, <laughs> to the audience. Are there questions that you have that you want to be addressed? Uh, I lived my whole life without being diagnosed. It took me a trip to Mendota, well, 13 months in jail, and then going to Mendota before I was ever diagnosed. Uh, do they have some programs now? You know, I see it's getting less stigmatized to have a mental illness, but do they go through the schools now and evaluate, you know, kids? so they can get help if they are struggling. I would love to talk about that. <laughs> uh, so, yes, and that's one of the biggest things that we are pushing. So a little personal story, I volunteered in my kids' classroom and I was like, oh, I feel like I'm in a rock and a hard place because I'm trying to be a parent, but I've also got this counselor hat on. And I also am feeling really badly for these teachers and the students that I see are struggling. And so I asked the school, hey, can I come in and meet with some of your students? So long story short, Yes, there are more and more and more providers and there are more and more school districts that are allowing outside providers to come in. I have found that all you have to do is ask. Um, I don't think the school systems necessarily know where to go or how to reach different providers. So as providers, it's important that we again try to close some of that gap. And there has been a lot more universal screening done. So the universal screening, the, well, schools can break it down anyway, but the gist is that it, it throws a net out there and it captures where there might be some underlying mental health concerns or behavioral concerns that suggest an underlying mental health or even you know substance use. So we're moving in that direction um, we just need to like keep pushing it because you're absolutely right. Thank you. Any other questions? I kind of had a comment on that. My, um, I'm part of the Recovery Implementation Task Force of yeah. in Madison, 
Um, and there right now we're kind of developing a curriculum that mental health is brought into the schools. And um, they're hoping to bring it as a, you know, like to take it to the school and say, hey, we have this curriculum if you want to use it. And within two years to get, get it where it's mandated to, that schools will be using this mental health curriculum in the school because it's, it's needed. That's excellent. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I just had a quick question at the beginning of this panel discussion. You talked about AA and other treatment options. I'm only familiar with AA, and I know a lot of people have a resistance to that because it involves a higher power. Can you talk a little bit about what other uh, treatment options or philosophies, I guess, are available for people? Thank you. I, I would say I'm uh, really grateful for that question. You know, as I mentioned, being somebody in long-term recovery, I will say that I had followed the 12 steps for a long time and I, I do have a lot of faith in 12-step recovery. However, I also know exactly what you spoke of that people come in and that, that isn't for them and that doesn't mean we should turn them away from treatment. Um, so there is a lot of different groups out there. Um, I know Andy talked about Dharma recovery. There's refuge recovery. There is women in recovery. Um, a great place to look for that is um, in the rooms dot org org they hold different meetings along all of those different lines online which makes them very accessible especially um, that really got amped up through the pandemic and it is still a great resource for somebody that struggles with anxiety i find that it's way easier to talk them in to sitting in a room and joining on the screen and not and not having to have the camera on um, or a trauma survivor so we've really used a lot of the in the rooms but they have a lot of those different programs. I'm also a firm believer in, um, as we're talking about mental health, that not only does it have to be recovery focused from the substance use side, I think any time, as we talked about human connection, it doesn't matter how you get connected. If that's through your church, great. If that's through depression bipolar support groups, awesome. NAMI, go to NAMI. They've got tons of groups. Suicide survivor groups, they've got a lot of groups for teens, um, anything. Like, we don't have to say anymore, like, you have to do AA. Like, I don't care where you go, as long as you're going with a group of people and getting connected to them, that's what it's really about. Dot com. Sorry, in the rooms dot com. I was going to say, I saw a lot of people pull out their pen and paper. So, in the rooms dot com, they also have an app that you can get right on your phone. I know you talked a lot about, you know, the dual diagnosis, and um, I'm just wondering, um, just from family experience, um, I've seen where the mental health is addressed, but um, the person actually is in denial of the, the substance uh, use, and so that doesn't even play, you know, get, get discussed in any manner. Is there a standardized... Um, assessment that counselors, mental health counselors should be using to make sure that that area is, is brought out because otherwise it just sort of doesn't even get addressed. I can actually take this one. <laughs> okay, so you're gonna talk about more clinicians needing yes. training of both? Yes. Okay. <laughs> So one of the initiatives that came out of our overdose fatality review as we go through that process, we make recommendations, and one of them that was made is that clinicians become more duly trained. So one of the initiatives Winnebago County is currently um, working on is getting more of those clinicians trained to feel competent in both substance use disorder as well as mental health, because it's in my opinion, a huge barrier for a client who has all of this stuff going on that they attend an appointment with their therapist and as soon as they bring up their substance use, they're told to shut it down and you need to make an appointment over here. And then there's gonna be all of these different appointments and then they're not gonna show up and then they're gonna be banned from the yeah. therapist and yeah. all of the crazy chaos that goes with it. So there's a huge need for people to be duly competent. There's not one standardized assessment per se. I think therapists just simply need to be more competent in both so that there's not the silo that we're actually trying to get rid of. And that's actually um, you know, one of the barriers that legislation has changed. Um, it ha it's 
so I'm a licensed professional counselor, and I also went through the substance use certification. Well, most people were just sticking with their mental health or they were only going with the substance use because that's what our licensure told us. If I'm, a, if I'm licensed in mental health, I can't touch substance use unless I have that specialty certificate or license. So that barrier has actually come down. So now, like to Sandy's point, the concern is just the competency and the counselor being appropriately trained to be able to pick up on both and feel comfortable treating both. Hi, so I'm a family support specialist here in Oshkosh and I work with people of all walks of life. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I always get weird voice things when I try to talk in front of people. Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering, you talked a lot about creativity and how that can be used to kind of bridge the gap that talk therapy does not meet. What are some things you might recommend that, obviously not a licensed therapist, that would be appropriate for us to do with some of our families that might need more than just a conversation? Great question. Okay, so I, can... I just handed the microphone over. <laughs> um, so anything that taps into creativity and whatever that means to somebody. So um, you could sit down with somebody and write poems about the weather. You could put some music on and just do some dancing. Um, the adult coloring books, mm -hmm. right? Those mandalas, the col and any coloring book really, it doesn't have to be specific. Get the 99 cent one. Coloring is really, really important. So anything that you feel like falls in line with creativity, even if it's let's go outside and blow bubbles, let's go to the park and just play and run around, get our body moving. All of those types of things tap into that creative brain. And uh, just to piggyback on that, Ro Rogers Behavioral Health also does a heavy focus on behavioral interventions, knowing that that can be a lot more productive sometimes. Again, that same lens of talk therapy only gets you so far. So something that you could work together, um, whether it's for yourself or with families, is identifying like what are their values? What are the things that they enjoy doing? Um, what are the things that they want to be doing? Setting some of those SMART goals and then moving them towards behaviors, like really simple things, like planning to have one dinner a night as a family increasing that to two dinners a night as a family. Simple behaviors like that will make a lot of impact, whether that's 30 minutes of reading every night, five minutes of a walk around the block, anything that you can do to get them engaged behaviorally will make a lot of impact in all of those areas. Hi, um, over here. <laughs> um, so you talked about, you know, kind of this, uh, lack of therapists available for folks. And I have experienced that a lot. Um, I work at UW Oshkosh, so with students um, not being able to find providers that have openings like any time in the near future, as well as like um, friends and, and colleagues. And so I'm kind of wondering just on your end, like how how's it looking on your end? Are you all like super booked out or like, you know, yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I guess from my standpoint, so <clears throat> as I spoke about, for me, Rogers does um, partial hospitalization and intensive outpatient. So they do not do individual counseling. Um, however, so that means we're treating patients kind of similar to what Megan had shared, like fairly acute cases, which is very high. We are on quite a wait list. Um, we're fortunate enough, though, to be a national organization, and so we are pulling on other sites. Um, throughout Wisconsin, we've combined up our sites to be able to share plan to try and reduce wait list times. So I know, like, as an organization, we're trying to do that, but I can tell you with, uh, we're hitting the same walls in trying to plan for aftercare for outpatient providers. Um, the article I mentioned earlier, that is common across the country. Uh, and I also know that the White House is working on uh, some initiatives to make some movement in that area. The other and, thing, oh, sorry, just to add is, and it's really dependent on insurances, but telehealth yeah. through the pandemic has been really helpful. And there's been a lot of providers that have been providing it that way. 
So that depends on, of course, licensure too, where you can practice in the, in the nation, but there's, that's an option to look into as well you know, over Zoom or whatever platform that they use. Yeah, and another thing that you could recommend, um, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of new apps and other platforms for um, self-therapy, they call it. So it is, the ones that I've been researching do follow um, some therapeutic framework like cognitive behavioral or dialectal behavioral, and that's a great bridge to help somebody who's maybe waiting on a wait list um, that they can you know use telehealth or use these kind of self-directed um, apps and things uh, to, to get them some type of relief or connection or support while they're waiting and we have to t uh, wrap this up but the other option um, for those of you that are local, uh, Lindsay and I have been honored to be able to provide um, a group at Solutions Recovery Center here in Oshkosh twice a week, um, which is for mental health and substance use, and it's free and anyone's welcome to come. And we use that as a bridge for people waiting to get into services. So for those of you that run into a lot of that provider struggle, um, it started last April because of the pandemic and the overdose increases and the suicides and just really all of the, the difficulty that's come into all of our communities because of it. So that's also another area of resource. So I want to thank... Real, can I roll? Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> See, I keep getting yelled at to end. Okay, no, quick, Very, Megan. very, very quickly. I, I just want to swing back around to what Megan had brought up about uh, the lack of assisted living for um, dual diagnosis. Rogers Behavioral Health did open a, the first supportive living in Sheboygan that is connected right next door to the clinic. And so that is in a supportive living that's open for all mental illness and co-occurring. So thank you. And the only other thing I wanted to add to is, that, again, if you're local, we have Solutions Recovery Center here in Oshkosh. It's open at 9 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. And you can just drop in and get coffee and hang out. Like, you, you don't have to go to a meeting. You don't have to do anything. You can just chill. And there's pool, and there's always somebody there. So it's always for good conversation. You can head down there as well. All right. Thank you all for attending. Let's go ahead and give a round of applause to the panel and to Griff. <laughs>